Morning. Hello, this is Gauri. And of course, this is Arlene. <laughs> What a lazy morning to me. <laughs> <laughs> It is so lazy I'm morning. still a half awake, even though we have to discuss heavy issues regarding our news. But yeah, how's your morning, Gauri? Uh, it's been pretty okay so far. I woke up kind of late today, but <laughs> I still made it here on time uh, to present our ASEAN Daily for all our listeners. So I uh, hope it picks up from here. Hopefully. So anyway, we want to start our news with something that is a bit too dark and he- heavy. It's about a news on a mother who was killed in Australia while on the phone with her husband in India. This uh, is something that was reported all over the world. Apparently, um, she has been stabbed to death in the Sydney Park. Uh, she was in a brutal attack while speaking on the phone with her husband in India. It was quite a tragic attack because she, not only was she on the phone with her husband while talking halfway, she was also only about 300 meters away from home. She was that close because apparently she finished work late, but she didn't want to trouble anyone to come and pick her up. So she tried to make the walk home, which is why she called her husband, just to sort of have a little company. But sadly, it did not end well and someone stabbed her along the way. When so why, why is this happening? And it happened in Sydney. You would expect, uh, you know, places in Australia, especially mm-hmm. like cities in Sydney and Melbourne and all that would be one of the safest in the world, but apparently not so. People can just kill you if they want to. Yes, and so far, they haven't quite figured out the motive of uh, why she was stabbed in the first place, uh, but uh, it seems, we don't know if, if it's a robbery or if it's uh, some kind of a freak attack by uh, some maniac who was just passing by Uh, the park as well uh, but it is a very uh, sad news uh, like you mentioned it was reported uh, pretty much in every single uh, media out there and a lot of people offered their condolences to the family as well especially but could, the, sorry yeah. but could it be like a hate crime like you know people kill other people because of mm. their racial origin I would I think that that is a possibility because there have been such attacks in Australia in the past. Uh, if we uh, look at uh, some of the past news, especially uh, sadly when it comes to Indian nationals, there have been uh, a lot of discriminations. Yes. I think uh, the problem with uh, a lot of these places in Australia is uh, the kind of discrimination that hasn't been really addressed mm-hmm. towards uh, coloured people. So. Uh, Uh, in a way, you know, it could be more than just a uh, maniac killing an uh, unfortunate lady, but I think on a larger, pe- uh, larger picture, it could be a hate crime that uh, the government of Australia need to address. And, yeah, like you mentioned, because although there have been such attacks in the past, but they didn't really talk about it, uh, probably because it was a sensitive issue, mm-hmm. but then again, it keeps happening and... Mm-hmm. Uh, such a tragic event like this so it's best to uh, start addressing the elephant in the room instead of pretending like it's not there and everything is fine in Australia so talking about elephant in the room mm-hmm. back in our uh, Malaysia's backyard mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> another elephant that needs to be addressed it's the 1MDB controversy so apparently Malaysian government will be prop in a 1MDB investigation isn't it uh, supposed to be you know due mm-hmm. time for them to be question whether they actually manage the funds in 1MDB well enough? Absolutely. I think uh, the entire Malaysia has been waiting uh, for, uh, I wouldn't say news like this, but for for the government or for the police as well. In this case, the IGP, uh, Khalid Abu Bakar, was the one who confirmed that Prime Minister Najib Razak will be investigated. And it's something that the Malaysians have been waiting to hear because for so long, uh, a lot of opposition leaders and uh, other parties have, as well have come up to talk about uh, 1MDB and uh, 
all the controversies and scandals surrounding it. But uh, our Prime Minister has been quite quiet besides uh, saying he wants to sue a certain uh, newspaper or a certain uh, individual. But uh, it seems now uh, the IGP has actually come forward and uh, going to carry out the investigation, including... Uh, this is a great step, stuff. actually. But I'm not sure how transparent investigation would be since uh, the IGP is has been quite infamous in terms of not being open and uh, transparent enough in its investigation on other issues as well. But at the same time, uh, this is also an optimistic news to show that you know the issue of 1MDB is something that even uh, the authorities in Malaysia are concerned with this so it's being investigated. Mr. Najib, as the chairperson of the advisory board to 1MDB, which has been uh, estimated to be worth 42 billion ringgit in debt and has been in the target of scrutiny by many opposition leaders and foreign press. In fact, uh, they were... Um, sorry, a New York Times mm -hmm. had been... Uh, uh, Airing, uh, sorry, had been re uh, written many uh, lengthy editorial write-ups regarding on the 1MEDB issue, investigative, investigative write-ups. The same with a lot of our local newspaper. And at the same time, uh, according to uh, Tony Poa, mm. uh, he has been raising this issue quite a few years ago. Only mm. now he has it has been such a huge deal that the public has been very concerned about it, regardless they are in the opposition camp or the Barisan National camp. And that also shows that uh, when something is something goes wrong or when there's a certain scandal, there's no way of hiding it too long. And uh, also uh, probably kudos to the opposition party in Malaysia as well, because like you mentioned, Tony Poa has been trying so hard for so many years to bring this issue to people's attention. He even got <laughs> defamation <laughs> or uh -huh. sued by uh, Najib Razak because of the his some of his comments on the 1MDB's problem. But he also said that that will not uh, slow him down or stop him and he will still go ahead and give the public the news that they deserve to hear, which yeah. is also uh, another... Uh, optimistic news for us because uh, in, a, in, in this country especially we always uh, we seem to have been dominated by the same ruling party over and over again and we want to see a balance when it comes to opposition and, and the ruling party at the so moment. So you are pro two system party, <laughs> two party system Yes I am and it's good to see that uh, Tony Poa said that nothing will stop him from uh, being transparent with the people and letting them know what they have to know. Well, my biggest problem is not so much on the 1MDB issue. My biggest mm -hmm. problem that the 1MDB issue has become such a big deal that it has gone beyond the original intention of Tony Pua, which is just mm -hmm. to uh, um, expose the debt issue. But now it has become the Achilles, is, uh, the Achilles heel of Najib Raza. And you know, the character Jolo has become one of the central figure of the scandal itself. But I think it should not be about the scandal of 1MDB. It should be about whether the funds were being mismanaged or not. And whether it involves Najib or not, he is the chairman. But I think internally, uh, the whole the whole 1MDB should be investigated for its structure, not for the person, one or two person in charge in it. It's true, and besides uh, investigating about whether the funds have been mismanaged or not, it's also important for them to start being more transparent uh, with uh, the people, which is also another thing that uh, we have been requesting for so long uh, by so many uh, parties, so many civil societies trying to uh, get the government to be more transparent with us and let us know what's happening. So that's another thing that they can probably start doing as well <laughs> to convince the people. Yeah, so hopefully the one MDB issue can be settled soon. Uh, if it's not soon, I think... Najib will be in big trouble in the next general election if he persists on going through one MDB without any transparency. Talking about transparency, of course, we would think about Thailand because it's now being controlled by the military junta. But uh, on another news, Thailand is on alert after blasts outside Bangkok courthouse. So something is happening there. 
something is brewing. <laughs> yes, and the Thai uh, capital Bangkok, of course, was on alert for possible bomb attacks against some 100 targets, uh, especially after the blast went out outside the courthouse. Uh, people uh, started panicking and started uh, coming up with more warnings as well for people from other places to also be uh, wary and careful. And the local media also reported that the police received this information from the two men who were arrested on Saturday after setting off a grenade outside the criminal court. So apparently it's the red shirt team that are uh, held responsible for the um, bomb scare, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and the red shirts are supposed to be the supporters of the former Prime Minister Ying Lak Shinawatra. You see, that this is the problem with uh, Thailand right now. Mm -hmm. um, political uh, legitimacy is totally divided by partisanship. So it's either on you are on that camp or this camp. But in reality, you are. I mean, um, even me myself, I think that there's there's no clear cut uh, focus on how different or their policies are. It seems like their policies are uh, divided only by personality, not so much on a real divide of uh, one is pro rural or one is pro middle class. Mm -hmm. It's it's too he's it's too hazy to me. And it's also because uh, Thailand has been divided for uh, such a long time. And what made it worse is, of course, uh, the the military coup that happened uh, last year. And also the mass, uh, less majesty law that is ma that means that they cannot speak out against mm -hmm. the ruling elites. And uh, this also caused the tension to become uh, much worse in Thailand. And also the timing that this bombing happened is... Uh, pretty much in conjunction with the highest tension that Thailand is facing at the moment. And there are also some opinion by the police saying that they, this bombing could have been done just to get UN's attention because people are so sick and tired of what's happening in the country. They're trying to get uh, outside attention now to come in and, and to but fix UN the problem has been Thailand. giving. But UN has been giving attention to Thailand for a long while. In fact, UN is one of the first organizations to issue statement when mm. the military junta took over and eventually become the prime. Uh, when she, um, sorry, when uh, the head of the military junta elect himself to be the prime minister. But probably they are not happy enough with the statement, and they want UN to do uh, something <laughs> more than that. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't think UN can do much mm -hmm. other than uh, trying to negotiate and trying to influence the decision making of the government of the day. But at the same time, my biggest concern would be, um, will Thailand's democracy be a reality one day? Because it seems like it's either they are being divided by partisanship or they are being ruled over by a dictator. And in this case would be the military junta. And like you mentioned as well, it's uh, it seems to be divided according to the personalities, which is also quite vague because uh, when when they want to support a certain party or a certain individual, it's because what that person is capable of doing for the country, and mm -hmm. it's not just about who's your favorite and who do I want to support. Mm -hmm. And I think my my dose for them for Thailand to improve is uh, another word: education and awareness. That's the only way to go. So anyway, <laughs> talking about education and awareness, we will have a short break. ASEAN Daily, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. We are back again. Hi, this is Gauri. And of course, continuing our ASEAN Daily. Uh, from Bangkok, we move to Saudi Arabia. This time is about religion being used as a tool for prosecution. And we are talking about Raif Badawi. Uh, Saudi Arab he mentioned that Saudi Arabia is surprised and dismayed at criticism of flogging, uh, sorry, flogging of liberal blogger. And it seems quite a surprise to us as well that Saudi Arabia is surprised at the criticism of uh, flogging because uh, in other parts of the world, he was received 1,000 lashes and that is uh, definitely not a small thing. It's, it's quite a, a big deal which received criticism from almost every country all around the world. Mm -hmm. 
And just to let you know that he already received 50 lashes in public mm -hmm. in January. So can you imagine this could be a lifetime of lashing? And this sentence was also criticized by, of course, the German Vice Chancellor Sigmar Gabriel, who said that this punishment is unimaginable ahead of a meeting with the Saudi king on Sunday. And uh, the reason why uh, he spoke up as well was because this, uh, this sentence has put a strain on the German uh, and Saudi relationship. That's been gone My well. question to mm -hmm. Angela Merkel is: Why even have a relationship with Saudi Arabia? <laughs> you can g you can buy oil anywhere else in the world. You don't have to depend on Saudi Arabia, even though they probably uh, supply most of the oil in the world. But it doesn't make sense for countries to uh, abandon human rights. Uh, in order for them to position their them their geopolitical interests in in places like Saudi Arabia, I don't think uh, that's the value of German and the Germans. Yes, yeah. you're you're right. And also uh, when it comes to Germany, of course they have very very uh, different approach uh, compared to Saudi Arabia in terms of handling uh, things. And another issue here is also of course uh, the reason of why he was arrested in the first place, which is because he wrote an article criticizing the Saudi Arabia's clerics and he was found guilty of breaking a technology law and also for insulting religious figures and this was sentenced in 2014. And since then, actually, a lot of people have tried to speak up against him. We even saw a lot of petitions going on Facebook and all. But uh, how effective are all this? And of course, the issue here is not just about uh, Raf uh, Rafi Badawi uh, alone. It's also about uh, how Saudi Arabia is handling all these issues in their country. Just because somebody wrote an article that th they were not happy about and you just sentenced them to 1,000 lashes. Which that is completely <laughs> inhumane. <laughs> it's completely inhumane. But for Saudi Arabia, mm. I'm not surprised they would act that way because I think to them, for such a long time, the West has been uh, closing one eye on every mm. single human rights violation that Saudi Ar Arabia has committed. In fact, Saudi Arabia is one of the strictest uh, country in the world when it comes to how they control their society. Uh, religion has become a tool to for consent for the Sa Saudi Arabian authorities in a way that is unimaginable, that you can't you can't say mm. anything that is against the authorities because to them, being against the authorities means you're against the uh, against God, which is um, to me is a bit weird. <laughs> Yes, analogy <laughs> and also, uh, uh, another thing is that a, lo a lot of uh, people even in Saudi Arabia itself they've actually come forward uh, to try and voice their discontent uh, saying that all he was trying to do is promote some freedom of expression and trying mm -hmm. to uh, show people that it's okay for mm -hmm. you to start thinking, for you to have your own opinion yeah. or your own take on things. See, you have to differentiate mm -hmm. him with some people who have intention to um, make fun o of religion. Mm -hmm. uh, like Charlie Hebdo is those kind of uh, organization that do that, but there's nothing wrong with it. But in the case of Saudi Arabia, I don't think Raif Badawi was in that position of making fun of religion, especially re religion of Islam, where it's the ma majority faith in Saudi Arabia. But I think uh, expanding the thinking or the critical mindset of the people is not, uh, it, is, it most probably would be what he wanted. Uh, as you all know, I the demographic of Saudi Arabia is uh, almost majority of them or 70 more than 70 percent of them are people younger than 30 years old mm -hmm. so they are craving for freedom of expression they are not necessarily against religion they are just wanting to express what they are discontent towards certain uh, judgment of um, of uh, the, the, the authorities in Saudi Arabia. I mean, for example, you have women there to drive all across Saudi Arabia just to show that, hey, it's nothing wrong. It's not against God's law for women to drive. 
that's uh, one some of the example mm-hmm. of uh, this enchantment for by the youth in Saudi Arabia. And when you have uh, a lot of younger generation coming up, they really ne- need to start getting used to the two ways of thinking. Of course, the older generation would probably just go along with what's already been practiced by by their fathers or grandfathers, and they just go along with the law because that's the way it has always been. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to this younger generation, they are bound to come up with questions. They mm-hmm. are bound to start thinking. Come coming up with their own uh, opinion and this happens pretty much anywhere around the world. It's something mm-hmm. that is normal where the younger generation, especially these days, are known to be uh, more rebellious. Uh, in, a, in a good way, they're curious. They they want to know the reason behind certain things. They mm-hmm. don't want to just follow or, ke- or keep doing something that's just been uh, practiced Trust me, they will be more Raif Badawi. Mm-hmm. I mean, he probably would be the first but yeah. he's not the last, uh, especially with the young population of Saudi Arabia, uh, people will be, you know, in solidarity with him, whether in silence or in maybe there will be another more uh, vocal version of Raif Badawi. And there's no point just trying to scare off these people who uh, who have started thinking because mm-hmm. uh, education is, of course, an important tool. And when you have that, you know what your rights are, especially mm-hmm. as a citizen and all. And if the more you oppress them, the more they want to stand up and fight and show you that there's nothing wrong with just having an opinion, writing an article or being forward about it. Mm-hmm. So, going back to Southeast Asia, mm-hmm. uh, regarding on Jokowi, so, of course, uh, we will talk later on on the uh, development of the death sentence by Jokowi uh, and remarks by Jokowi, but before that, he, Jokowi actually raised curtains of uh, the largest dam constru- construction project in Sumatra. In fact, the spokesperson of the Public Works and Public Housing Minister, uh, J- Joko Mursito, said that the development of the dam was aimed at providing a reservoir with a capacity to accommodate 30.5 million cubic meters of water. It is hoped that the dam will prevent floods for the next 50 years. Hmm. Uh, it seems that he also said the dam would function to provide irrigation water for uh, thousands of acres of land and also provide uh, raw water amounting to about 500 litres per second as well as water-based power to generate hydro-powered plants. So it seems they are going for a very uh, very hydro-based uh, uh, ki- kind of economy here mm-hmm. where it's all uh, being done by using water, providing <laughs> the dam, the irrigation, and also to even to generate uh, hydroelectricity in this mm. case. In fact, energy generation mm-hmm. is one of the key agenda of a lot of the ASEAN countries, as we've been reported over and over again how countries like in Laos uh, and Myanmar are looking at uh, building more dams to accommodate with the energy needs of society who, are, who has becoming more and more middle class in terms of the social and mm-hmm. class structure. So the same is happening here in Indonesia where the lack of energy means that they need to provide more and more um, dams for the people and of course preventing floods would be the next best thing why they should build a de- uh, build the dam but at the same time as we've been reported before building dams comes with some ecological mm-hmm. repercussion so um, in a sense the local community might not be happy um, and also the environment might be jeopardized so these are the areas that uh, President Jokowi might need to address before it, you know, the the floods of worms mm. come out. And that you are spot on with that because uh, as much as uh, we are excited about him building the largest uh, dam in Sumatra, uh, he has to also take into account what are the. Uh, uh, ecological uh, factors, what are the consequences when it comes to uh, building this dam, especially if it's going to be such uh, a large dam, the kind of location he chooses and also the people living around there, mm-hmm. uh, what, what's going to happen to them and there are a lot of factors that, that go into it as well when it comes to building mm-hmm. a dam. So another news about Jokowi that is not so good Mm -hmm. is uh, as I mentioned earlier the death penalty Uh, a few days ago he actually gave uh, an exclusive interview with Al Jazeera which he mentioned uh, to Al Jazeera he's still convinced 
the justice system in Indonesia. In fact, he said that if you look at the drug crimes, it is still valid and it is based on facts and evidence. Um, but in reality, uh, if you look at the recent news reported by one of the news agency in Australia, uh, a lot of the people that are being affected, especially the family victims and also the, the victims themselves who are currently in jail waiting to be executed, they are definitely not happy. In fact, their whole life have been destroyed because mm -hmm. of uh, the, the kind of harsh punishment that the Indonesia legal system is inflicting towards them. And uh, especially in this case of uh, one individual, of course, that we have here who said that his ghost will come back uh, to haunt them, to haunt uh, all those involved in passing the sentence and also uh, carrying it out uh, in the judicial system. Mm -hmm. And what's also interesting here is that he is uh, allegedly saying that he was wrongly sentenced mm -hmm. uh, for sent wrongly sentenced to death for this because it wasn't actually him who uh, had who was in possession of the drugs it was actually his friend mm -hmm. and they were just uh, they just happened to be caught together so why is he being punished when he was when he did not possess anything at all that's the problem with drug crimes mm -hmm. compared to you know uh, more heavier crimes like murder like murder you just uh, y especially with the technology of DNA it's easier to actually find who are th who is the perpetrator? Uh, although it's still imperfect in a way that it sometimes people will be wrongly uh, accused. But in the in, in the case of drugs, uh, a lot of a lot of people are being prosecuted, especially for death penalty, mm -hmm. not because of heavy crimes like murder but because of crimes like drugs. Either you use drugs or you trade drugs or you export uh, or, or you are the medium person mm -hmm. who some uh, who unfortunately you could be um, accidentally exporting drugs for some other people if they uh, misplace or they uh, mm -hmm. purposely place drugs in your bag especially when you're in the airport it could just be a favor if somebody could just tell you like hey can you pass this bag over to someone mm -hmm. and you do it without actually knowing what's the content of the yeah. bag and then that person gets caught and you get a death sentence for so this way I my question about death sentence there are two things mm -hmm. it's not so much whether the death sentence is too heavy or I mean it's justified or not justified I think uh, Jokowi needs to look at a bigger picture uh, especially when it comes to the drug offence is it on par uh, in terms of the weight of the crime with death penalty uh, because when it comes to charging drug offences, people can be uh, wrongly accused quite easily, in fact. Mm -hmm. And this is another reason uh, why we had the whole campaign uh, previously by uh, Mr. Uh, Toshi, who is a human rights activist who came down. A lot of people who uh, were on the death row, according to his research as well, were uh, mostly wrongly accused. And the problem with death penalty is once you've carried out the sentence when the once the person is gone if some new evidence resurfaces it doesn't even matter anymore because that person is not alive anymore and there's pretty much nothing that you can do about it mm. like in the case of um, this guy as well he has submitted some papers to uh, the, the judicial officers but because of the amount of red tape because of the amount of uh, high bureaucracy that they have, the papers were just lost. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, when not to mention mm -hmm. uh, the court system in Indonesia is filled with graph. So in a, in a sense, uh, people could just wrongly accuse you uh, by uh, receiving bribe or by just wanting to do it out of you know no no other reason. And uh, which is why. Uh, in, in this case, it, even if the papers do come up one day, it probably wouldn't matter anymore because they have already uh, put the, the wrong person mm. to death. To me, another another area that we should look at, mm. Jokowi is definitely jeopardizing his international and regional image as a moderate and progressive leader. If he still insists on the death penalty and not, and still assume that uh, the, sis the justice system in Indonesia is fair enough, which I don't think is fair if you look at the bigger picture and if you link every uh, all the other evidence together. And it seems like one day he's like Barack Obama and, and a few months later he kind of became like the king uh, of Brunei. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we will take one short break. When we return, we will have our other two news 
on sexual violence and also on A Asia. ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. Okay, back in our news commentary for our ASEAN Daily. So, talking about sexual violence, Indonesia has gone one step ahead because of the new draft bill that will define six types of sexual violence. And the National Commission on Violence Against Women, which is also known as the Komnas Perempuan, has listed six forms of sexual violence that will become the basis of a draft bill on sexual violence, which will be uh, out pretty soon. And some of the uh, 15 types of sexual violence that they highlighted uh, that they have narrowed down to six uh, basic ones, which is rape, sexual harassment, sexual exploitation, sexual control, sexual torture, as well as sexually charged punishments. Mm. And to me, what is really interesting is uh, the draft bill drops other forms such as forced pr- prostitutions, forced pregnancy and abortion as well as traditional practices like female circumcision. So anyway, uh, Komnas Perempuan member Ira Harsano said that it was too difficult to insert all 15 types into the bill. I would agree with her. I think they should have a separate bill just to describe or to define uh, other forms of sexual violence that is hard to be defined. It's true, especially when it comes to Southeast Asian countries uh, with Indonesia, with Malaysia. We tend not not to uh, uh, delve too deep when it comes to a certain act where we have uh, one particular act for this uh, this particular crime and that's it. But when you, if you really look at it, there could be so many uh, different subcategories as well, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to uh, issues like uh, sexual violence. Uh, instead of having uh, just one umbrella, there's actually uh, so many different approaches to look at it. And I'm glad that they actually include sexual harassment because mm-hmm. in Malaysia, unfortunately, we do not yeah. have laws that protect against sexual harassment other than, especially in public, uh, in the workplace mm-hmm. is more towards the consent of the private sector if they want to do it or not. So anyway, uh, kudos for Indonesia. Hopefully that they will inculcate all 15 types of sexual violence and they make, sure, make sure that they, you know, this, this can be a, a draft bill that other countries in Southeast Asia can follow suit. For another news, which is very interesting and very positive, mm-hmm. is Malaysia will be airing the ASEAN Travel Channel. So finally, we have a travel channel that is about ASEAN. Exactly. And this is also uh, another move in line with our ASEAN Championship uh, this year, where Malaysia has been trying to come up with a lot of ways uh, to uh, sort of pioneer the whole ASEAN effort uh, in this region uh, compared to uh, Myanmar last year. So uh, this Travel Channel is another new effort that to apparently spur the tourism in this region by uh, airing it around the clock starting from June, according to the Facebook page virtualmalaysia.com. Th- that's really awesome, but to be honest, Gary, I would rather travel, <laughs> go travel myself than watching a tra- another travel documentary. <laughs> It could be helpful in certain ways where, where if you want to know where's the f- best place for shopping or food. Or I like music. to get lost in a city. Okay, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> anyway, that's all for our news today. Uh, I just have one question. Yeah. So which city you want to get lost in, Gary? I would like to get lost somewhere in Myanmar or Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Not in Bangkok. <laughs> no, you, you never know what happens there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to get lost uh-huh. in Kuala Lumpur. Okay. Because that's where all the uh, pockets of communities all over Southeast Asia would be there. So Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> visiting Kuala Lumpur is like visiting mm-hmm. all 10 countries of Southeast Asia, mm-hmm. I suppose. <laughs> anyway, that's all for our news today. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We have all the updates and the latest news. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the daily podcasts and also you can find us on TuneIn app if you're on the move and you want to listen to us. Bye!